Thanks very much for the invitation. Uh, a short history of Sea Green. I think we've got about 25 minutes. Um, uh, as Graham said in his introduction, uh, uh, I've been living in Sea Green now for about 40 years. So that's one uh, qualification for being able to talk about the village. Um, and also, more significantly, I'm Mary's husband. Uh, yes. And we got involved with village matters. Not immediately we came to the village, but pretty soon afterwards. Um, I'm not a professional historian, um, but I'm interested in the community and understanding what's happened in the past, mostly so that we can understand that and uh, value it and, uh, and look forward to uh, uh, maintaining the value of the village. Um, a little subtitle there, it has become a little paradise, which sounds wonderful, doesn't it? Um, and indeed it is, but it has got a little sting in the tail, that statement, which I'll come to in a moment. Now, some of you will know where Sea Green is, so others of you will not. Um, we're just off to the northeast of Beaconsfield, uh, next to our far more famous, I suppose, uh, uh, companion village of Jordans, so Sea Green and Jordans. We often get talked about together. The station has that name. Uh, our histories are very, very different. Uh, everyone tends to assume that Jordans has got a much more richer a more interesting history than Sea Green. Um, I'd like to disprove that, um, or at least test it. Um, Jordan's village, of course, has only been in existence for about 100 years, just over Sea Green, certainly for over a 1,000 years. So we're tucked away uh, off the A40, away from the M40, and that's one of our great assets, that we are hidden away. I was born and brought up in Slough, um, and I didn't, I'd never heard of Sea Green, and I don't, I don't think I'd ever been here until we moved here 40 years ago. And tucked away is one of the key terms really for Sea Green. This is a very ancient map, uh, looking at the Chiltern Hundreds, which you will have heard reference to. Well, there were of course groupings of areas in, in, in the area in which we live. So we've got the Stoke Hundred here, and the Burnham Hundred here, and the Desborough Hundred here. And the strange thing about Sea Green, which is this little gray patch here is that we were disconnected from our hundred. We were actually connected to Farnham Royal uh, in, in, the, in the hundred of, of Burnham. So for over a thousand years, Sea Green was part of Farnham Royal up until the mid 19th century, in fact. Don't ask me why, we don't, it, it lost in the midst of Anglo-Saxon times as to why we were linked there. But in practical terms, what that meant was that the villagers here uh, you, their, their local church was Farnham Royal, about eight miles away. So in theory, at least, they used to walk down there every Sunday for a service. Um, certainly their funerals would have been there. Um, their tithes were paid to, uh, to, to, to uh, Farnham Royal Church and so on, um, which is quite significant, I think, in the development. We were a hamlet for many, many centuries rather than a village, but a very independent and independently minded hamlet, I think. For, partly because there was no manor house here, uh, no lord of the manor to oversee what was going on, which sounds like fun. This is another map which is now looking at, at about 1300, um, where the main focus of this map is on a village called La Stock. Now, La Stock was the old name for Coles Hill, uh, which you'll all know, between Beaconsfield and Amersham, or as it has it here, Beaconsfield and Agramond. Um, and this, what, what is interesting about this map is that it, it butts onto Sea Green, which at that time was called La Serre. So we've got La Stock, La Serre, and over here, La Pen, um, good Norman names. This road here, the boundary between La Serre and La Stock, is Bottom Lane, which still exists today. And this little bit of history that we picked up in 1223, there's a record of Henry de la Serre being killed by the bastard Nicholas de la Stock from just across the way, no doubt fighting over land on that very lane of, of bottom lane that still exists today. Jumping ahead by several hundred years, we are so fortunate in the village to have this wonderful map that we found in, in the British Library up in London and got a copy of. This is, this is the actual map itself. Um, I have been up there, I've handled it, it's wonderful. You can go up there, unroll it, 
and, 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 and look at the detail. The detail is absolutely fantastic. It's hand-drawn, obviously, but every field, virtually every tree in the village is drawn. This 1753 map, which was prepared for Lord Godolphin, uh, who was fine and royal based, of course, but he wanted to take stock of his village and the area around it. And it details every, every field and every house. And this is part of the map. This is the center of our village of Sea Green, spelled S-E-A-R, Green, at this stage, not S-E-E-R. And it shows every house and building in the center of the village, the tracks uh, are going through the village and so on, which are still pretty much identifiable now. And wonderfully, a list of all of the cottages and houses in the village and who was living them at the time. So uh, this 15, we've got Henry Worley, uh, who the Worleys are still around. 16 is William Worley. And the one that I really like, I think is beautiful, is this one here, the little cottages, number 11, I think it is. Uh, if I can find it, uh, it is the four cottages on the waste for the use of the poor. So we had our own little four cottages equivalent of a poor house in 1753. We then jump ahead um, to 1831 when the village was enclosed. Um, I don't know about you, but I never learned about enclosures at school very much. But in fact, they were, I think, one of the most significant things ever to happen in this country when the land was redistributed and the, uh, moving uh, from the old uh, medieval land distribution and use of the common to a tidying up, as they called it. But also, of course, it was a land grab. And so here, if we compare, that's the 1753 map. And they came along and they tied it up and they created this lovely triangle, which is the center of the green at the moment. They created all of these building plots around the green and they created this smaller green in the center, which within 40 years was where they built the church. So this is where Sea Green lost its green. Um, but we can literally uh, um, track the, the modern village from this map directly. So nearly 200 years now. This is our village, even in terms of the width of the various roads and so on, the building plots, and we'll follow through in a moment and look to see what happened to these plots and so on. And again, some of the names here are still around in the village. W. Seister here was the uh, were first person we ever met in the village. He was the landlord of the cricketers uh, pub that we went in the pub when we came to look at our house here. And um, well, it would be nice to say he gave us a warm welcome, uh, but it wouldn't be true um, because he was a very old villager, very suspicious of newcomers such as us, even if we were going to buy a pint in his pub. So the population of the village at this time, 245, we now 10 times that size, although I don't think you'd know it from the intimacy of the village. A few of the old buildings in the village that still exist. This is Hall Place, which is reckoned to be the oldest uh, building in the village. Um, it's really a collection of cottages. Um, it's reputed to be the site of the Black Prince's hunting lodge. By, that's what history tells us, although history, local history can be a bit misleading because there's a bit of a gap in the time because I looked him up and the Black Prince lived from 1330 to 1376. Um, and this is uh, 15, uh, 60, 17, 80, something like that. So we, we got a problem of, of a couple of hundred years, but never mind. Let's not let, let that get in the way of a good story. Um, it's known as the Black Prince's Hunting Lodge. A couple of other 16th century uh, houses in the village, beautiful pond styles and colliers, uh, um, uh, still in existence, still serving their purpose as beautiful residences in the center of the village. Around the green itself, this is some of the housing that was built subsequent to the enclosure. So the top one is labeled, it's a postcard named the High Street in Sea Green, which sounds very grand. We didn't know we had a high street. There's a church cottages on the lower left, which have subsequently been demolished, and a couple of beautiful cottages with their residents back in about, what should we say, 1900. Those cottages still exist um, in the center of the village. The village modernizing. Uh, this is the famous Jubilee Well, built in 1887, the Queen Victoria's Jubilee. Two, two beautiful photographs 
uh, of the well, uh, the one on the top right, the lovely scene of the children dancing, no doubt at the opening of the well. This was called the wide place within the village, and one a bit later uh, showing the, the, the well and what was called Jubilee Walk. This was a great asset for the village. Uh, up until this stage, there had been a few wells, but they were private wells, but they weren't available to the, to the residents. This one was available, but not on a Sunday, because uh, using the well on a Sunday was considered to be uh, beyond the pale, you might say. Sorry, that's a terrible pun. Um, and uh, so it was locked on a Sunday. Uh, I guess you had to go to the pub instead. This is one little, little building in the village, a very inconspicuous building, but it's one that I love and I'm very, very interested in. Uh, this is the parish hall, the church parish hall it is now. This was the first civic building built in Sear Green, and we know the date, 1829, because it's beautifully carved in graffiti in one brick on the side of the wall. Uh, uh, it's a lovely little intimate hall, it's not quite so intimate now, it's been expanded in recent years. On the right hand side is where Mary and I decorated it for our son's wedding reception back in 2002. The history of the hall is absolutely fascinating. It was built in 1829 as a lace making school when lace making was taking off in this area. Um, and by about 1840, most of the girls and, village, uh, and uh, girls and women in the village were actually employed making lace. Um, which must have been a very, very important source of income because agriculture around here has never been particularly rich and so on. Uh, so the hamlet has a great source of income for about 20 or 30 years. But by the 1850s, that trade was fading, it was being mechanized. And, and at that stage, in the mid 1850s, the hall was uh, taken over by the Baptist church and it became the first Baptist church in the village. Um, and uh, pretty soon thereafter, try, catching up, you might say, the Church of England bought, built the church on the green to make sure the Baptists didn't, uh, didn't take over the village. Although they're still very strong, both churches, in the village. And this is a wonderful quote that we, uh, I found in Bucks Free Press. Um, uh, uh, soon after the Baptist church was open in, in, in the village hall, and I'd just like to read you the second paragraph because it is priceless. This little village has, within the last 10 years, been transformed from one of the most profane, immoral, and irreligious of places to an abode of piety, love, and all things of good report. They now appear to live and love as one family, and the little chapel seems to be the centre of their chief attraction. Intemperance and Sabbath breaking are very seldom met with, and almost every cottage is sanctified by its evening vesper. Thus, from being proverbially bad and a terror to the surrounding neighborhood as a nest of fighters and highwaymen, it has become a little paradise where these once affrighted neighbors now love to visit, to be cheered with the scenes of piety and love. It is truly a striking instance of the power of the gospel with only such instrumentality as Sabbath school teachers and a town missionary. So there you go. We were saved back in the 1850s by the Baptist chapel, and we were converted <laughs> from being a, a nest of fighters and highwaymen. And indeed, there may well have been a bit of that. We love to think of ourselves just sneaking over the hill to the A40 and raiding the stagecoaches going by between Oxford and London. Um, and uh, not too much of that going on now, but, you know, it, it, it's, it's modern, modern, uh, 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 fighting and highwaymen live here now. No, that's not true, of course it isn't. But it's a, that's how we became a little paradise. But the pubs didn't go away, as you wouldn't expect. So these were our three public houses at the beginning of the 1900s. The one on the left, the beautiful photograph of the yew tree, which sadly was closed back in 1909. And look at those wonderful characters. And there are people in the village still who know who they are. They are family related. The two on the right, the, 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 it's the three horseshoes at the top, which appears to be the oldest pub now in the village, uh, still going strong. That's a Victorian photograph. And the one lower left is the Jolly Cricketers, beautiful photograph. And both of those two pubs are still serving the village, or not just at this very moment, sadly, but still going strong. We look forward to them reopening again. So drinking goes on, but perhaps not quite in the way that it did uh, 150 years ago. 
So here's the new Baptist chapel. So when the, as the Baptist church thrived and expanded, uh, they bought this plot of land across the road. One of those plots that you saw being freed up from the enclosures in 1900, they opened this new Baptist church, which is still there. It's now a, now a residence, however, they've moved on again to a yet bigger uh, uh, Baptist church within the village. And this is now a beautiful home lived in uh, by, by our friends, uh, Mick and Kay Tilly. And Mick is a wonderful carpenter and he's, he's converted it beautifully. There's a lovely story related to the land on which this is built, we discovered as we were researching, doing our village researches. And it relates to this document, uh, which is a massive document. Uh, you don't really get the scale here. It's about two meters by a meter and a half. You have to walk, walk around it, apparently. And it's signed off by someone called, with the wonderful name of John Plato. He, he was uh, apparently the owner of this plot, and we don't quite understand how he came to be the owner, but he was selling it. Now, John Plato's story is absolutely wonderful. John Plato was, lived in Chesham, um, and he was literally a barrow boy to begin with, and he was a drunken barrow boy. Um, he was famed as a drunkard he, across three counties, they say. He was, I think the quote I saw recently was, he was the most famous drunkard in Buckinghamshire. So that's saying something, isn't it, at that time? Um, but he went along uh, to a temperance meeting, um, uh, and, uh, and by repute, uh, he was drunk at the time, surprise, surprise, and, and being totally drunk, he went up and signed the pledge. He couldn't remember doing it the next morning, his wife says, uh, but he stuck with it, and uh, remarkably, he became one of the leaders of the temperance movement in this country. And we know this because it is written up in a book of the 10 leaders of the temperance movement. And John Plato is one of the key characters mentioned in that book. Um, he helped to found the temperance hall in Chesham. Um, and in fact, I've seen subsequently researching the web, there is still a, a, a property company in Chesham called, uh, by the name of Plato. Some of you living up that way may even know of it and be able to tell us a bit more about the family. But we we were delighted to find him. He's buried in, in Chesham. Uh, not so, not quite a local man, but a wonderful story, nevertheless. That's the hardware in the village, the streets, the buildings and so on. But obviously the village is made by the people and we're deeply researching the, the, the village people from the 1753 Godolphin map, the 1831 enclosure map. Um, we've looked, we've done a systematic analysis of the 10 year censuses from 1831 onwards, which is fascinating because it not only tells us who lived where, but what they were working at at the time. So we get a, a picture of the population and their employment. We're looking at other sources of data like early historical records and so on. Something strange called the Lord George's Doomsday Book, which I'd never heard of, which we, Lord George apparently was planning just before the First World War to do a complete inventory of property and, and land in the country. It never got finished, but some of it is available. And very importantly, most importantly, ultimately, local photos and family research. These are some of the old records, the really old records, 1673 muster book. Anybody who had a horse that could ride a horse in the village, not too many of those. And the one on the right, the Burnham 100, which I mentioned to you, Posse Comitatus list, 1798. This is a wonderful record um, of all those men who were available to go and fight Bonaparte when he invaded this country. So here we have from 1798, a list of all the men in the village of Sea Green. This is available for every village in this area. If you're interested, you should really get it from this little company, Eureka Partnership. And here we can see the men and not only are they listed, but some of their infirmities are listed as well. So poor old Jazz Loveridge only had one eye. Josh Reed was lame in the knee. Joe Stafford also one eye, and Caleb Stafford nearsighted. I'm not sure if that would get him off from uh, uh, from going to fight against uh, uh, Bonaparte. But there you go. These were the men all lined up, ready to go and fight him had he invaded. In terms of the employment within the village, this is I mentioned that the, the they saw this is a wonderful photograph of Mrs. Body one of the local families sitting outside those church cottages that you saw earlier 
with her, her lace making and some of the tools that we've got from the lace making. And that's a piece of Bucks lace or sea green lace that was made locally. The other trade, important trade was woodworking. Uh, um, uh, particularly what we call is called bodging. Um, bodging was cut, taking the, the uh, wood from the from the forest around here, particularly Hodgemore wood, turning it rough, the first rough cut of the legs and so on, and then sending it off to Wickham to be finished, particularly in, into Windsor chairs and so on. And these are local families again. These are the Warleys on the right, uh, and the, and and and. Uh, let me just check the names, just to make sure I get them right. I beg your pardon, they're the Paynes. That's Joseph Payne on the right with his son, um, and on the left, who is broom making, Mr. Gadsby. Of course, they all appear on the censuses. We can track them down, and we can, we can pretty much be sure where these workyards were within the village doing this bodging work and so on. Farming has been relatively important, but not perhaps as important. The, the land around here is not particularly rich. So there are these wonderful images of the local taken in the local fields. And the one on the left is uh, is pig, pig, keeping pigs in the center of the village. And this this street was famously known, nicknamed as Rasha Row. And some of the lovely people in the village were actually born and brought up in Rasha Row. And ironically, it's now been converted into one of the poshest streets in the village. So the pigs are gone. Um, to be replaced by rich people. <laughs> the village, as you may have seen on the first slide, is called the Cherry Pie Village, and this is because there were extensive cherry orchards around here until very, very recently. Um, and also a lovely story of a, of a cherry turnover recipe, rather than cherry pie, being found in the chimney of one of those old cottages when it was demolished. So we have that document. Uh, and it records how to make a proper cherry turnover. So the, the sea green is known as the cherry pie village, and that's one of the remaining, few remaining cherry trees in the, in the village. The, the, the orchards were built upon at the end of the 1970s. There wasn't a lot, as far as we know, of local protests. There would be now. Whether that would be right or not is, is, is one, a good debating point, because what was built then was the Manor Farm Estate, which brought new people, new blood, new children into the village, and really has become a very important element of, of, the, of the life of the village now. So villages can't stay still, they have to develop over time to, be, to, be, uh, to, to continue living. And here are some of the children. We've got photographs of, of, of the school, which was built in 1859, going way, way back. And that's one of the first head teachers who are named. Again, it's one of the body family. Turning to the topic of the day, this is our war memorial. Uh, 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 this is a photograph that I took two days ago, beautiful war memorial, which was actually only built about 10 years ago, which has become very much a focal point of the village. And of course, from that war memorial, we get in very important records of the, of the local villagers who were killed in the First and Second World War. And here we see some of the village names, the Paynes, the Whirlies, and so on, the Goodalls. Mm -hmm. These names are still around. And in fact, we're talking with so many of those families now. And one of the people I'm talking to is Oliver Payne, uh, who lives locally. He's got a wonderful collection of photographs of his family. This is James Picton, the great, great, his great, great grandfather on the left, sitting outside Peaceful Cottage. And this is Private Edward Payne, who was killed aged 19 on the 19th of July, 1916. He was recruited outside the Three Horseshoes by a recruiting sergeant who came to the village. He lied about his age. He was 17 when he signed up. He was 19 when he died. This is family information from Colin Boddy, who's also got a wonderful collection. This is Mrs. Boddy. You saw this earlier, her lace making in Sea Green. And this is Lance Bombardier, Colin Boddy, who was killed the day after D-Day, after the landings. Going up in the ranks, this is not quite in Sea Green, but we sort of claim him because he sat, had such an influence on the village. This is Lieutenant Colonel William Baring Dupre, um, who's the owner of Wilton Park and who's responsible for us having our railway station, which is a very, very important development in the village. Uh, Colonel Dupre uh, from a French Huguenot family um, 
went off to uh, his, his forebears went off with the East India Company uh, to Madras, became governor of Madras, made a few shillings, came back and uh, and, and bought uh, and, and developed the White House at Wilton Park, just to the south of, of, of Sea Green. Uh, this was his his abode. Uh, it wasn't demolished, or it was demolished in the late 1960s to build that tower block, which you see from the M40, the military tower block, because uh, Wilton Park subsequently became a very important military base and so on. Um, but we don't have time to go into too much detail on that just at the moment. Um, but from our point of view, the important thing that Colonel Dupre, to bring him back for a moment, was a great sportsman. He was a world champion croquet player initially, um, no doubt on that basis. He became MP for, for Beaconsfield for many years, um, but he then got into golf. And initially, he built a nine-hole golf course just near the A40 on his on, on his estate. But he, he, as golf became more popular, um, he saw an opportunity. The railway company came to him in the early uh, 20th century and said they wanted to build across his land. And he said, okay, he said, so long as you build a halt, a station for my 18 hole golf course. And they said, you haven't got an 18 hole golf course. He said, no, but I so will have. Um, and sure enough, he got his halt and he got his, his, his golf house ju uh, just next to the, the railway. And that's how we got our railway. It doesn't just happen, of course, people work very hard. And here are some of the locals, in fact, where, you know, word is that the, the, the Irish navvies built our railways, but in fact, a lot of the local people got involved as well because it was no doubt very lucrative. And this is one of the Whirly family over here holding the dog and so on, these wonderful photographs for our railway, the building of our railway. So the station was opened, <coughs> formally actually came into, into operation towards the end of the First World War, one of the last stations and last railways to be built before the renowned HS2 came, started to be constructed around here. It was initially known as the Beaconsfield Golf Halt, uh, subsequently, several years later, became City Green and Jordan Station. And that's been enormously important course for the development of the station. It brought people out from London. It brought people out interestingly to the Jordan's Meeting House, which was in decline until that point. It brought people out here to settle out here to build houses and so on. So our population from 245 and it stayed steady around that pretty much up to the First World War. We're now 2,400 and the village is thriving um, and a very, very popular village. Uh, and uh, a little paradise, what well, we like to think so. Uh, certainly got a very interesting history, uh, and we very much enjoy, are enjoying researching it. So thank you for your attention. I hope you enjoyed that short history of the village of Sea Green. There is more to say. In fact, uh, we are actually taking all that information, putting it onto a computer-based uh, history of the village, uh, which is a project we're currently doing with the Chiltern Society, which is very interesting and very exciting. It was also, in, in terms of technology and smart city, um, well, we are using the technology to, to do this history. And also we are using LIDAR data, which is available now, uh, beautiful scan data from the Chilton Conservation Board, who have done an extensive scan of all of this area around the Chilterns and so on. And it's throwing up all sorts of new exciting finds in the village and so on. So we're working with them to bring that into our history. And we may even have found a beautiful Roman road going through the village, but I'm not allowed to too, tell you too much about that at the moment. So watch this space. Thank you very much.